everybody, welcome back to G-Bears Off-Grid Ways. And it's another nice day. Strange, yesterday was chilly and rainy, and here we are today, clear blue skies, sun shining bright, and kind of a little on the hot side. So, it's that time of year where the weather uh, plays yo-yo, doesn't know which way to go. What are you doing? You little crazy dog. Comes over and grabs a hold of my shirt tail and pulled on it. Alright. Let's get back to business here. So. Yesterday we were talking about water. And uh, when it comes to water off grid, again, very, very important. The number one priority. Water. You can always figure out something to eat. There are plants, edible plants out there. You can find them all over the internet. But you gotta have water. Gotta have water. So, once you get set up into your new off-grid property, one of your priorities is going to start setting up rainwater collection. Okay, rainwater collection. You see, I've got a gutter across the top of my shipping containers. The two shipping containers and a garage in between the two gives me a 40 foot by 35 foot surface up there. So if you multiply 35 times 40 and then divide that by 0.6, that'll tell you how many inches of rain you can capture in a one inch of rain or how many gallons you can capture in one inch of rain. Okay, and then you can do your math from there. So, coming out of the gutter, I've got a downspout in the center. I've got them both sloped coming to the center. Okay, so they come, it comes down, and what are all the pipes about? That's called a first, first flush system. And what that does is, when it first starts raining, of course, there's going to be dirt and debris and bird poop and everything else on the roof. Okay, so when the water starts rushing down, it's going to wash everything out of that, and it's going to come down this pipe. Uh, inside of that pipe, there's a plastic um, smart water bottle, I think it was, and it just fits perfectly inside of there with enough room so it slides fairly easily. So as the water comes in and starts filling that up, that plastic bottle, has got a cap on it, of course, and it's empty, will start floating up. And as it floats up, it gets up to that T, and it can't fit through the T because the T is a little smaller than the pipe. And once it gets up to that point, it blocks off the bottom, and then the water flows and goes that way and into my water storage totes. Then I have them all manifolded together like that. And I have a hose connection on that one. So when those are full, I just have to step out the back door here, go over, throw one switch, and the water will um, start, what's going in there will start going into here until these are full. And then uh, by that time, usually the rain has stopped, and the next day, I'll get going on, you can see a garden hose here. I'll transfer that water down to the garden or uh, wherever else I need it. Now on each corner of my cabin, I have a 55 gallon plastic barrel. And I drilled and threaded a hose connection in the bottom for draining them. Now, I didn't put first flush on those because that water will never be used for anything but irrigation. I have one on each corner of my uh, my cabin, except this one corner over here. I do have a first flush on it, but that has two barrels because this is the largest part of the roof, the cabin roof. And uh, once uh, the first barrel goes through the little fl first flush system, and once that's full, then I just open that valve and then this one fills up. And then I'll get 110 gallons here on this corner. So 
I can get uh, about, uh, let's say 110, 110, that's 220 plus 50, uh, plus 55, actually 60. These are actually 60 Allens. They call them 55 because you can't ship them w with them full all the way to the top. They've got to have some air space in them. So they're about five gallons um, shy of being perfectly full when they ship them. But if you fill them all the way up like I do with the rain, there's 60 gallons in each. So that'd be uh, five times 60 or 300 gallons of water just caught off the roof of my cabin. And that's a important thing. And you can use that water for other things, you know, watering your plants. Um, even the dogs will drink it. They like rainwater um, pretty much because these dogs were all desert dogs. They were all born here in the desert and all abandoned. And uh, they ended up here where they've got a loving home and a place to eat a couple of times a day. And they always have fresh water. So they're happy. Okay, so that was the uh, second tip on water. So with that being said, let's move on and uh, get on to electrical. So we touched off on electrical for our new um, off-gridder, but we, we didn't really get deep into it, right Donna? All right, so electrical. Uh, everybody talks about um, getting uh, uh, charge stations and all that stuff as backup. And now, I don't see it. At the cost of those uh, uh, those portable charge stations, you, you can just add to your solar system. Get more solar, more batteries. So how do you figure how much you're going to need? Well, when you first get out there to start, you can run on the bare minimum with uh, say 300 watts of solar, um, say a two to 3,000 watt uh, charge controller, or I'm sorry, a two to 3,000 watt inverter. And then you want to have like, um, in the charge controller, there's so many different ones out there. Um, I, stay, I say there's a couple that are very easy for beginners to learn how to use. And there are some that would drive you crazy, right? like um, a Pow Mister. They, they they claim that they got a two button setup on those things. Trust me, it is so um, difficult setting that thing up, trying to remember every little setting that's on there. Whereas when you've got the multiple buttons, you can press this and then it uh, you press the up or down arrow. It's that simple. But if you got uh, just two buttons, then they're all multi-function. You press it one too many times, and you've just lost what you were um, setting up to change or set up. So stay away from those crazy little ones. I'll uh, I'll post a couple of links in the um, description of some fairly decent starter uh, systems that you could buy that aren't that expensive. And... Uh, down the line, save your money up and get yourself uh, a good, um, like, like Sun Gold Power. Uh, the, uh, they have these all-in-ones. You get an 8,000, 10,000 or so, or an, even an 18,000 if you got a big enough place. Um, all-in-one. Everything is all in one unit. But you don't want to run one of those in, a, uh, in an RV because it's just... Um, too bulky for your RV. So I'm going to um, put some links down in the description of this video for um, different components that I believe are fairly decent and easy enough to understand um, and figure out. And uh, that's what that's where you want to set up. You want to have enough power so you can run your normal stuff in your RV and still have enough enough extra power so you can run some power tools so you can build things um, and build your cabin uh, whatever your, your storage sheds your outhouses all that stuff you're gonna have to build that stuff 
and you're going to want to run power tools to do it. And uh, there are some of my older videos where I talk about different power tools I'm glad that I brought out with me. Things like a skill saw, a table saw, um, a metal band saw, uh, drills, uh, screw guns, uh, battery powered stuff. All that stuff, all going to be uh, lifetime necessities off grid. I use my stuff almost daily. So I was in here today and I did a little more wiring cleanup. I didn't put a board back there yet because I haven't found one I like. But uh, when I do, I can just slip it in and put a screw on each side just to hold it there and cover those wires. But I did put um, cables from that other LiPo 4 battery up to my shunt and got that tied into the system so I've got extra power. All right, so um, with that being said, I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, yes, on the shunt, the um, negative cable to the charge controller should be on the load side of your shunt. And uh, I had a little controversial about that on my uh, previous videos about the setup in the van. Well, if you don't put it on the, uh, the load side of the shunt, then you're not going to be able to see when you're charging. You won't, you won't know when you're charged. You won't know when power's going in. So it does have to go on the, the opposite side of the shunt. Now, on the unit that I was using in the van, there was an error thing that said if the display is flashing, if the display light is flashing, um, that shows an error that something is, is connected wrong. And when I connected the negative from the charge controller to the load side of the shunt, I was getting a flashing screen. So I switched it back. But that was, still wasn't right because I wasn't getting a reading of showing that I was charging. So in the meantime, I did get it switched back again to being on the load side of the shunt. And what I did discover is that the flashing on and off display, you see it going on and off, is actually only telling you that it's in charging mode. So it's charging the battery. So right now, as you can see, I've got power coming in from the sun through the MPPT and it's charging the battery. So I, I did put it back where it belongs on the, on the other side of the shunt. So I stand corrected on that. So make uh, corrections in your notes if you haven't already. All right, so we're at 92% uh, here on the, on the charge for this battery. And I want to get it back up to 100% because I'm going to be doing some um, off-grid powering out of my van so I can show you a basic solar setup of what you need to get going out in the wild. Now the only thing that I would do different that I didn't do when I, when I started, because I was as naive as anybody else when I started, this inverter. Even though it's been a great inverter from Harbor Freight, and uh, I've got two of them and they, they, they're better than 20 years old and they're both still working just fine. Problem is, is that they are modified sine wave. And you want to have um, pure sine wave for your uh, off-grid stuff because now all of your sensitive electronics like your sm smartphones, your laptop computers, your TVs, all of that stuff all require clean sine wave um, electricity. The modified sine wave could damage them. I'm not saying it will damage them. I'm saying it could damage them. So keep that in mind. And if you're going to buy a, an inverter to take out with you, don't go any lower than 2,000 watts. That's what you want. And pure sine wave. Uh, if you can get one, you want to get one that also has um, a charger capability. So you can hook it up to a generator and then if you have a, a problem with 
no sun for a bunch of days and you need to charge your batteries you just fire up your generator and the the inverter becomes a battery charger and charges your your batteries those are great I'll put a link to one of those in the description of this video also in the meantime we're 92 percent and saying I got quite a ways to go before I'm at a hundred percent so I'm going to call it a day and hey it's a day look it's a day <clears throat> and uh, go inside and edit and um, post this and I did take some new photographs in the desert today that will end up being posted um, probably this weekend at the beginning of my video on the intro so you'll you'll see some new pictures and I'm going to try to do that every week or every couple of weeks so you get to see new things. This is G-Bear signing off.